Well, good morning, everybody. Yeah, welcome to our little safety session and to our first talk with Philip and me regarding coding guidelines. Should we comply, shouldn't we comply, or what should we do with it? So, yeah, I'm Nicole. I'm a functional safety expert for, I think, about 15 years now. I've been a software developer before. Uh, developing embedded software mainly in the context of safe applications, a little bit automotive, a little bit military, what you do these days. And um, actually, we founded our little consultancy about three years ago, and uh, we're working mainly in the context of functional safety, cybersecurity, and yeah, hopefully more and more open source with it. My personal main aims are really applying functional safety with a common sense, so not over, I always call it over fusification, so we really use common sense, make your uh, system or software better, make it more reliable, make it more safe, don't even, don't um, focus so much on the compliance uh, point of view and what I'm also aiming is uh, uh, applying more and more continuous integration, continuous deployment principles to safe or secure software. Yeah, for me in the embedded stuff, but generally having functional safety and continuous principles combined. Philip? Yeah, I guess uh, this is also the way how we came in touch like three years back, yeah. more or less uh, taking the path from different perspectives. So. I'm Philip. I'm currently a technical business development manager for embedded open source at Bosch. So I'm going through different events, try to bring open source into Bosch, Bosch people into open source, checking this, where do new projects make benefit for Bosch in the product development. And yeah, I'm also the ELISA project TSC chair for this year. I am Linux Foundation advisory board member for the Linux Foundation Europe, so not for the larger one in the US. Um, personally, I'm not like uh, ever time since Linux user. I guess I started like 2005-ish around it or so. And but I was always using open source tools. So this more the way how I came into the whole thing. And what we also did was using Linux and automotive. Since more than 12 years, we brought our first device into the market, which is a 2.628 kernel, I guess. And this was also the first time where we came a little bit in touch with. Uh, coding guidelines, MISRA rules, and so on. And we saw that it's not always easy to make use of it also in open source components. We've struggled with deviations and so on. So I thought that's why I also jumped on when Nicole and I had the idea to talk a little bit about this. Uh, I guess we, I don't know how many of you, maybe we do a short very first poll, how many of you are using coding guidelines, MISRA C, or related on a regular basis? That's good, most of you. So I don't know if you see too much more on this, or if you learn too many new things because we, we touch it more on server base, but I guess this gives us room for a discussion later on. So everybody who lifted the hand at least has a chance later on to lift it once more for a discussion point in this. From the agenda, we try to get a little bit of the motivation. So to talk about coding guidelines and principle, what leads us there, where they help, and so on. and. For those, I mean, this may be a little bit boring <laughs> for most of you at the beginning. So what coding guidelines are, what it basically means, and to also exp how you can explain it to others who are first not familiar with it, what our intentions about it. Um, a little bit on what you may need to consider for choosing guidelines and so on, and going into some practical examples to say, is there really one coding guideline which can rule all of them? already taking this up front, uh, or of course they typically apply to certain language and not to all the languages you see around. <laughs> and yeah, and then the, at the end, what you should do for a documentation part, uh, yeah, that's where we go on. So, and from the motivation perspective, uh, we see especially in mission critical systems, it comes in, so in automotive, even if you don't have safety rated parts, it comes in, there's often regulated environments where a lot of things are asked to be followed. And that's it, that sometimes the people come in and say, okay, here's this coding guideline, you have to apply it. And then you see the source code and things you have written by intention and with purpose, and you figure out not exactly everything, it's just giving a full fit. So it's something where you need to start 
evaluating or adopt certain guidelines, but the thing that you really make up your mind early, so we'll talk about this also a little bit later, and there is often predefined, that's what's that predefined coding guidelines without a common sense, so you shouldn't use them without this part, without understanding or just taking it for granted. Uh, yeah, then motivations also, it's really this strict alignment to the coding guidelines. Uh, I guess the strongest one which I saw in the past was always the MISRA C, which comes also often safety critical discussion and this is in ELISA. So we are looking into the Linux kernel mainly. Uh, this information up front, I guess we will not make the Linux kernel MISRA compliant. Right, so, and I guess, well, nobody maybe wants it anyway. And yeah, so therefore you can end up with deviations. And first of all, now let's go over to what is really a definition of a guideline, because we're talking here about coding guidelines. And I guess Nicole just takes over. Yeah. So just let's start with yeah, with the definition. So what is a guideline generally? So I very often get the perception of people, yeah, oh, there are coding guidelines, and this is the law of the project, and I can't deviate in any kind of way. And yeah, as I'm not a native speaker, and as I think a lot of non-native speakers still have this nice little uh, advanced learner's dictionary in their bookshelf, yeah, just to look into what's the definition of a guideline. And actually, the dictionary comes up with two definitions. One was, yeah, it's a set of rules and instructions uh, that are given by an official organization telling you how to do something. So, for example, yeah, the government has drawn up guidelines for schools during the pandemic. Sounds pretty official, right? On the other hand side, uh, the dictionary also gives you the de definition saying something that can be used to help you make a decision or form an opinion, like, yeah, the figures are useful, a useful guideline when buying a house. It won't say you in detail how to use these figures and that they are uh, set in stone, but it's more, a, yeah, a guideline in the sense like we use them in the coding guidelines. So it's a guideline to help you make a decision. So what does it help you? It, it helps you make a decision about yeah, how to streamline your code, how to make it you look uh, unified, how to improve the readability uh, through it to have all the constructs all the time in the same way from having your curly braces like you have them from the intent, uh, intentations for how to use certain constructs of your language. In the end, it um, uh, sh uh, shall make your coding easier because you don't need to think about special things. You know, you don't need to come up with something creative that differentiates you from your colleagues. Um, also, mainly also to, uh, to avoid common mistakes. I did code heavily in C. C has a lot of pitfalls. It gives you a lot of freedom and a lot of room for creativity, but. It, if you're in a rush, if you don't know how to use certain constructs, or even sometimes it's very platform specific or compiler specific because it's not defined for 100% in a formal way. So yeah, the coding guidelines should just close the gaps or tell you to avoid certain constructs that might be um, problematic in your uh, coding language. And actually, yeah, it's uh, guidelines or style guides. It's nothing that comes uh, to us the first time when we use coding languages. It's in a natural thing in languages. If you think about punctuation, also our words, our, the way we construct our sentences are not 100% clear sometimes, and that's where punctuation comes in. And yeah, our Favorite example is, yeah, let's eat grandma or let's eat comma grandma. It saves a life. And also applying coding guidelines can save a life in our context. Well, what we typically also observe that uh, there's a large hesitation when coding guidelines come in. It feels like being regulated, being governed. And uh, it, says it makes my life much more complicated as a programmer, right? Because I, I get this additional tool, it's not fancy, 
I need to read through things, and then suddenly I, I made something by intention. But yeah, I guess that's something where we may start screaming. And also, uh, sometimes really it looks like it doesn't make sense. And I guess these regulations, you may find it in your processes of a company and similar areas or in a government as a way say, well, that's at the roof. They try to find rules for all, which is uh, not always the best idea. I, I still like that in Misra it said there is no, you should avoid go to by any sense, so it will look for any go to which you write. But if you look into the Linux kernel, for example, there, there's good reason to, to have a go to in, most likely, right? For just saying this makes the structure easier, it's better to read. And for, but the guideline itself cannot say don't use go to unless you know what you're really doing, right? Because then you will say, I know what I'm doing, and that's not the case. I mean, if I talk to my kids, they also say, oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Say, so, oh, can you drive a car? Yeah, yeah, so sit down, drive the car. Oh, uh, what do I have to do? Yeah, right, but before you were convinced, you, have, you are already do know what you're doing. And, yeah, they're also the impression that they have to be applied at all costs, and this is something which makes us really nervous, and we say, no, that's, that's not the thing. But there are also uh, really good reasons to go for this. So uh, it can, for example, close certain specification gaps, right? Things which the compiler does not find. You know how to use it, but it's just some guideline on top because the compiler never made it to this point. And it could also be, if you have hardware-specific architecture, something you could say, this is generic, but there is something which you have to avoid because we know that the hardware has certain limitations. It cannot detect certain memory barriers and so on. And there's also the low-hanging part of it with increased readability and uh, yeah, avoid quite strange constructs so that you really go for it. And I guess we come to also some more coding style related things later to in the presentation, which I guess a bunch of you may use typically always and do not even ask for it, at least if you're in the Linux kernel area. And yeah, this can also avoid later on to have certain pitfalls in the language. And this is basically just the same thing. And yeah, it's also not also, even if it's sometimes static analysis, this can also go into the dynamic behavior of the code. So in the end, it's still really there to make the coding life easier and products more reliable, more robust, secure, whatever. And what I see in there, if you apply these kind of things, if you, I don't know, Another poll, how, how many of you spend quite a significant amount in uh, reviewing source code in pull requests, merge requests, patches, and so on? That's not as much as before, but still quite a lot. But at least I remember when I read through, I can sometimes, so if I have people in there, I can say, oh, first clean up, look how the rest of the code has been written. How, how is intention used? How do you define things? And it costs really a lot of time you spend just for these formalities. And for this, I see out there projects out there which we just define rules and say, please run this script up front, it does certain checks for it, right? Or use this tool up front, or even stating, we will use this tool. You may not be aware of this tool and cannot access this because it has some proprietary licensing in there. But there is a good enough first step in there when you use this one. This is freely available. And just get your clearing, run through it, and you're much faster. So and this is really the intention of it. Uh, to have not only your single one person maintainable code, but having others in there, having peers, having reviews in this. And this saves us a lot of time by just giving this to a machine, giving this to a program, and let you help going through this. Right. And then it's the time to select a coding guideline, right? So, yeah. I hope you're sold now, but why you really use coding guidelines, or at least think about it. And so how will you choose the right coding guideline for you or for your project? And actually, the first and foremost thing that you need to think about is what is beneficial for my project, for my product? What do I need? Is this rule even applicable to me? Do I want this rule? Do I need this rule? Or do I need more rules that are previously there that I've looked up them somewhere? And then really consider the objectives, like Philip already said. Does this address um, my understanding of a readable code? Does this address really all the pitfalls that I might run into? 
do I need maybe to add more information for yeah, certain deviations that I might accept or maybe there's certain levels of skills that I need to add to um, use certain constructs or deviations of some coding guidelines. And actually, just after that, you can consider, hey, is there something around that I can reuse? Is there a similar project that already has coding guidelines that I might want to look into? Is there a de facto standard like, yeah, the ubiquitous misra that is used by my industry that I need to look into and there might be stuff in there that I can reuse for me? So actually, yeah, first step really is look into what's beneficial for you then really look into just what you want to have really um, meet the objectives, what you need to have for coding guidelines, and then, yeah, look what's already there. And as we want to automate as much as possible and we don't want to do reviews just to check coding guidelines and all that stuff, having an automated checker is really beneficial, <laughs> believe me. So, yeah, the most common uh, coding uh, guidelines and standards that are around, yeah, I'm coming from the safety uh, world. I used MISRA rules before I actually knew the word MISRA. For me, it's some things were really clear or, let's say, very clearly communicated in the project how things are done here before I even knew MISRA. And, um, MISRA mainly focuses still on C, C++. Uh, there's a lot of modeling uh, stuff in there. So it's, yeah, let's say classic safety domain stuff. Um, there are the third rules, at least in my perception, they are more common in the security uh, focused projects. They are even available for Java and Perl, I've seen. Actually, when you look into MISRA, when you look into the third rules, in the end, they address the same things. You want a reliable code, you want a readable code, you want to avoid pitfalls of your coding language. So they are very, let's say, they're not completely similar, but they're like uh, very like cousins uh, uh, pointing you into the same direction of how you might want to work. But that's not the only coding guidelines around, so we have a few more for you. Yeah, I guess we almost all come from the embedded space or mainly working embedded. Uh, I don't go into full details of this, I just wanted to say there are guidelines for various kind of language, right? And it doesn't need to be mission critical, it can also be just uh, in a server environment or other parts. So it would be like for Go or C sharp. And even if you, I mean, what I recently heard more often is like, if you're programming in Rust, you don't need the coding guidelines because a lot of things are already in the compiler, but actually, if you develop the Rust language, then you also will follow coding guidelines, style guidelines, and how to do this because it's crucial in such a large scale project also to have a common sense and have the basic things considered. And this may be for those which are developing a Rust compiler, but also who would like to extend the language, right? So, and this one is just mentioned here, and sometimes, uh, there are also just related things. So I took some part, we have it here at the last one, it's the check patch, right? The check patch Perl for the Linux kernel is not really like it gives you any programming hints, but it's mainly for concentrating on the style because here it's really, really crucial that everything looks similar. On the contrary, I, I also remember when discussing with engineers saying, oh wait, I'm just writing test code. So. Um, I don't know why, but sometimes there's a perception that test code may end up with a different level of code quality than uh, the one which you bring into the product. Well, it's like, wait, it should be the other way around because you don't write test code for your test cases, right? So that's the other way. And um, I also added Python, and I especially took the Python and the robot framework because within Bosch, I cannot speak for the whole Bosch, but I can speak for some areas where we went in and we said, if you look into, for example, your continuous integration, there need to be rules that your continuous integration, your tools are also properly assessed, right? So even if you run code checks in the source code for the product, you should also check things which are in this CI, CD and development, development flow. And we made a rule for some project where we said, you are not allowed to introduce a new tool as part of the CI 
if it doesn't come with linting. So we will always have lint checks also, and if you then add some tool for the CI, the tool itself can also again check linted, and by this it helped us also a lot to increase the quality of the tools. There are also some examples uh, which are more rigorous. So the next to Elisa, and I think here it's quite nice because the it's better to argue on this. So for the Zephyr project, for example, as the artists, you have a smaller code base, and there are also guidelines described, and the TSC and safety committee in there also said we would like to follow certain guidelines. They, and if you search for it, there is a bunch. I have one example on the next slide, I guess, uh, where you really are considering how to update things, but it's also a hard pass, right, because you need to reach the people. Sometimes it looks strange. Uh, you're, if you're an artist, you're heavily resource constrained and you know how to do things, so you may think differently about how the source could you write. Will you initiate a variable explicitly or do you save this amount of mem memory again? So these are things to be considered. And on the contrary, this is Xen project. I don't know who have attended the Xen for Safety talk at the beginning of the week from Stefano. I guess he was pointing it also there. They are on a path to have a MISRA compliance, for example, and they say, okay, we can do a lot of these things because we have just around 50k lines of code and we have a community which is really committed on a lot of these regulations because they come from a secure, safe perspective in the project also with a majority of their users. So, and what they, for example, do, I mentioned this, um, they use the Coverity scan for now, but you need to be a member in there and you need to see certain things, so it's not fully open there, so you, cannot, you can see some results if you go for the scanning part, but it's not that you can pre-scan things easily. So for this, they said, run the CC CPP check upfront on your contribution. This already helps to reduce potential pitfalls a lot. Right. And yeah, one example that it does not always make sense or that following rules strictly can cause you some headache. This is also one which I took from an issue on Xen project, there is a MISRA rule, I think it's 3.1, and this is how you don't never use uh, nested comments, something could go wrong. Unfortunately, when someone has written the original C comments or C++ comment, then uh, they were not considering URLs, and somehow also the MISRA rules were not considering URLs. So for this, if you have just an yeah, HTTPS address in there, this will be a MISRA finding. So if you want to make an external reference, this is something hard. But maybe we jump over to some real world best practice examples. So uh, I hand over to Nicole again. Yeah, so um, yeah, as by the abstract, we promised you some examples. So I had to come up with some. And actually, I don't like to play the game, the blame game. So I needed to come up with something from myself. And I haven't been coding for a while. So yeah. Actually, this is my yeah my grill in my kitchen, and the story behind this is the first thing or one of the first things my partner asked was, "Hey, can, this is cool. Can we put an alternative firmware on it?" And I was like, "Hell no!" But let's just assume we took this as a project and created some source code for it. And as you can see, my little piadina here it has some nice grill stripes on it, so. I don't only want to have the normal temperature curve on this cooking stuff, I really want to have it really uh, a piping hot, sometimes with a boost function to get all these nice little stripes on my piadina. So how could this code look like? And for sure it's safety critical because I don't want to burn down the house. So. So I like my code to be as short and as clean as possible, so I have three main functions yeah, that don't do anything at all state where I just touch the touch screen unintentionally and nothing should happen. I have the case that I want to use the boost function. I have the case that I want to use the normal heating. And actually, when I use a boost function, I, uh, the uh, normal heating function follows after that. So in my case, I say, OK, if I have boost, run into boost. Uh, just uh, don't break, go further into normal heating. If I have normal heating, yeah, just switch the boost, uh, uh, skip the boost, go into the heating function. And yeah, if I, if I uh, don't do, want to do anything, don't do anything, just break, leave this function. And as I'm a safety person, I always add an error handler at the default case. But 
yeah, my miss attacker would blame me for not using an unconditional break after my boost case. So, yeah, what should I do? So on the one hand side, I could say, yeah, I make my code longer, I add a break, I add the function uh, for heating into the case of the boost function. Actually, I don't like this. But yeah, in this case, you really have two options. You could try to argument why you leave it the way it is and you have the way, yeah, make it compliant and change it. So for me, my de decision was, I don't want to change it so officially I need to argument why I deviate here from the rule. So I said, okay, does it, uh, may, is it on intention? Yes, it's on intention that I don't use a break here and uh, it doesn't make the code quality lower, it doesn't make the code unreadable, and it still meets the objectives to have a readable, uniform, and understandable code because it's an easy function, and so also it's as short as possible, you can see it on a glimpse in one moment what this uh, switch case is doing. So in this case, yeah, you can really do two things. If you prefer the compliant way, change it, Nobody will blame you, or you give a reason why you don't want to change it. Uh, you could also implement this function with an if-else. It's e easy. So I'm always in a rush, so use an if-else sta uh, statement. Actually, yeah, you know, I only want to use the heating or boost followed by heating. So yeah, quick and dirty. Actually, this would, on first intention, do what I want to do. It switches on the boost function when I choose boost and follows the normal heating temperature curve or straight goes into the heating temperature curve. Yeah, and once again, uh, the, the Misra checker is blaming me for not um, ending my else if construct with a general else. So do I need to change this again? Maybe, let's try. So. Yeah, I'm just at two lines, call the error function in the else path. And actually, now it doesn't work anymore because every time um, I'm unintentionally using the touch screen and I want to do nothing, I get an error. So, oh yeah, I for forgot to really use my do, do nothing um, variant, so yeah. Adding my do nothing to it, I see, okay, now it again, again does what I want it to do. It doesn't go into error state. And actually, yeah, complying with my coding standards helped me finding an error. And I think we all know every day life, these careless errors, they just happen because we're all in a rush the function itself sounds easy enough that you might do it b even before your first coffee. Maybe even your reviewer won't find it because yeah, it's so easy, I just read through it, yeah, that's what it, it should do, and go on with your life, and then you have a problem, and fixing stuff afterwards always is more hassle than doing it beforehand. So, yeah. It can make sense to use Misra in the end, or Misra-like rules. So. And how can I do this? Yeah, I guess, first of all, it's also important to mention that simply implementing the rules, like you said, can really cause also to damage your code. So if you just follow the rules and did everything, not always the intended functionality remains, right? So I remember things from the past where we tried this and uh, or some of the engineers in my group did, and suddenly we found regression then in testing because it was just from the code change that nothing behaved as before anymore. But uh, whenever you have it, it's very important when you deviate and say, no, I'm not implementing it, that you document it, that you put a comment in there which explains what it does. Uh, I try to blame some of my, not directly blame some of my engineers, which I had in the team, but I try to blame what we have done. So I was looking for good examples, and actually I can say from the source code, which was quite old, I was hesitating to show the comments, because nowadays I didn't understand the comments anymore, so be careful in which kind of comments you make that other people may understand it also later on. Uh, it's good also to really do this in code reviews, so not have it, having it also as peers, so that also the peers understand what you do. And uh, it could be good intention also just to tag these kind of things and do a specific tag, which is 
uh, maybe project specific in which you work on because it may not comply to all thing and you may want to reuse the code. And also consider that it's independent from the static analysis tool because a lot of the static analysis tools also provide you a way of writing it, but you never know when you change your tool. So then you also have to add this and see at least a chance to get it more generic and a bunch of these tools support this. Right. And it's also good to have some kind of ticket documentation if it comes to safety critical work. I say this is a documentation, you get a traceability in there and this will help for later assessments. Then, uh, yeah, as I said, so from a structured way, you have this in the code, you put some reasoning, you may add there, you need to document your design decisions later on, try to do it wherever possible. And then if you have done this, this would be just a normal way but we are in a safety critical, mission critical environment, so there's just a little bit more on the ratification of this deviation because you really do this. And for this, if you see on the left, the larger block, we have an overall objections of the coding guidelines and we need to make sure that these are not violated. And the thing is not like you do it afterward, like you maybe sometimes figure out, you come from a nice thing, you would like to select a certain tool or something, and then you start with the evaluation after you have already, in your mind, selected more or less a tool, and then the evaluation is pointless because it always shows you the results which you want. So in the best case, come up with these parameters before, and this gives you a better chance than to really discuss about, am I deviating here, do I need to change something? Then, uh, yeah, I said about the statement, and see, uh, this is the th upper part of it, and the last part would be the documentation of certain safeguards that are in place to avoid violation of coding guideline objectives. So this means like, could also be pre-compiled statement and other things which you could actually bring in to make sure that there is no chance of violating things. And um, it's not direct related to this, but what we, for example, also did was we changed that uh, in the GCC, we said minus v error also that we have say every warning turns into an error, which also just helps because it's not direct coding, but like these kind of things are to consider. And the last thing, this is really safety specific, I guess. There is the underlying part, so it's you need a clear approval. This may be additional hurdle on this to have a last ratification on this, but typically there should be either depending on your organization how you do it. There should be senior developer, maintainer, safety manager, whatever you have in there who should work on this. And as we were on this punctuation part in the beginning and the example why it's important, I found a statement from Edgar Allan Poe from 1848 who was saying something about coding guidelines. And he said that coding guidelines are important, all agree, but uh, only few know how to comprehend the extent of its importance. And if the writer who neglects coding guidelines or mispunctuation, mispunctuates, is liable to be misunderstood, then uh, yeah. This goes on like this. I really, you can just read through it shortly on your own. I found it very nice because already there it was mentioned. Uh, this is a long time ago and he points out to a punctuation. What I still also want to say is Edgar Allan Poe, I hate him for his sentences which he writes. So <laughs> I would say this is not going through a typical coding guideline or style guide. Right, and by this, I guess we come close to the conclusion of it. Yeah, so yeah, I, I'm also not a big fan of how Edgar Allan Poe writes, but yeah, punctuation makes it at least readable, kind of. So yeah, do we need coding guidelines? Yes. I think there's no doubt that we need them in some kind of way. Uh, do I need to follow a coding guideline standard for 100% all of my life, all of the time for each line of code? No. Really, yeah, I'm a fan of common sense, use, use your brain. And so what else do we want to tell you on the long term? Yeah, please spend more time beforehand when you start with coding guidelines, when you choose your coding guidelines, define what you really want to have, um, define the objectives of your coding guideline, and uh, maybe even when you define your coding guidelines, come up with some examples for your team, come up with uh, maybe even deviation rules, What how you need uh, to document your deviations or when can you deviate. Uh, actually, and also reconsider your coding guidelines. If some rules start to bother you or bother your team on the long term, yeah, lessons learned. Think about it, uh, adapt it, uh, change it, 
use another one, maybe add another coding uh, rule if you need it. So yeah, it's a process. And please, for the sake of uh, maintenance and continuation of a project, document all your decisions because they won't be forgotten then. So this said, thank you everybody for being here. And yeah, we'd like to hear your comments, questions, opinions on that. Thank you. Just a sec. Uh, thank you for the good talk. Uh, does you know safety or security certifications allow those type of deviations? Yeah, the big C word certifications. Yes. Uh, with a certification audit or assessment, you will get the question, do you have a coding guideline? How did you come to this coding guideline? And how do you apply it? And where are your verification reports? And actually, when I'm in an assessment and I ask my customers, how do you um, um, apply your coding guidelines? And they, they say, I have 100% uh, MISRAG uh, coverage, and I don't have any deviations. And I say, OK, I don't believe that your code is really do, uh, doing what it should do and that it's working. And then I get the deviations. And usually, yeah, as long as there are, there's a reason behind this and they're documented, all will agree that you need sometimes a deviation from a rule. We also have one up here, May. Oh. Okay, yeah, not. Uh, um, maybe maybe one in the back and then Yeah, the maybe front. in the back and then in front, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, the talk. Very, uh, a lot of things touched. I think one more thing that um, I observed that pushes back developers from using that. It's not that developers don't want to follow them, or it's about how hard to integrate these checks. And, uh, example, with Caverity. And do you think that in any uh, nearest future, we will get something like a Clank flag dash dash mi check Misra, like we have with Clank tidy or mm -hmm. with Clank format or anything like that. I, I guess we don't get a direct thing in there. I don't believe in there because it's also also here we were very careful and just don't giving too much about the Misra part because some parts are like standards, but there are other tools which already have command line integration and then you can just say it may not be the full fit, but like the CPP check is something which you can just integrate into your CI pipeline or you have other tools which just uh, go through the repositories and just provide you with a report which have IDE integration so that you can use it with your Eclipse IDE Visual Studio Code. I'm not sure about an Emacs and Vim integration, but uh, at least the recent ones which are more in this, so that you directly go, you see a report, you click on it, jumps to the source code, and you find this, you can document things. I'm hesitating to say, do the documentation all in the tools that what these tools sometimes enforce you to or want to enforce you, so then add the additional step, this creates a hurdle, but I doubt that there will be full straight away integration, but what you can do if you're a power user of it, if you use it in your company, you can say, I would like to have this. And the more people say, we need this, this makes the life of developer easier, the higher the chance get that it gets in. And we have a question in the front. I have the microphone here. Uh, so there's kind of two extremes I've seen in programming. Um, obviously, one's no coding guideline, but in, in a practical sense, the Linux kernel coding guidelines are short. There's a lot of justification clearly written by developers for developers um, based on years and years of experience. I've also uh, was at one company that had a 50-page coding style guide that just had amazing stuff, clearly some of which was very personal <laughs> to the person who wrote it. <laughs> So um, is there, I'm sure there is, I just don't know how to find it. Uh, maybe there's a collection uh, somewhere. Is there, are there people doing research on this so that we can actually have some, um, you know, really sort of A-B comparisons. If you do it this way, you actually get a, a noticeable improvement, at least something subjective, ideally something ob objective. Um, you know, I mean, Misra also provides justifications. This is really good, but you may or may not agree with all of those things. It would be nice to be able to say, Look, yeah. it actually helps. I guess you can. 
in the end, you will not find the rule of thumb thing in here, because if you make a generic statement on these kind of rules, then you would end up with uh, this one size fits all t-shirt or socks, and they do not fit one size all, right? right. That's, um, that's clearly true. Yeah. I saw that there have been studies again and again, and even also around the, I think for even from the Bucks thing, they do some studies around it, right? Because yeah. they have a university touch in there as well. Mm -hmm. So for around the Misra, there's something, but not really comparing all the different things and say this is the best thing of all or the comparison of it. Maybe a good research area. Yeah, that's sure. what I'm wondering about. If, if there is some place that you can yeah. find research about yeah. that. There is research if you look for it. It's mainly, I, I looked into some papers and they are like, yeah, there are coding guidelines or these Misra rules or whatever, standardized rules, and they are not as beneficial as people think. That's then the end statement, and I don't I don't like the uh, how they are constructed. So I mm -hmm. would have would love to have a more yeah discussion, yeah. seeing both sides, and yeah, saying okay, in this c case it will be beneficial to that extent. So, but I haven't found a really good paper on it. So I would have referenced one if I had found one, but <laughs> I don't I didn't like the ones I found. Yeah, it's I mean it is really hard to do that because you actually have to have multiple people writing multiple things according to different standards, and then you have to actually have something big enough that it can have defects in it, and you can see defect yeah. numbers, readability numbers, all of that stuff. Yeah, so maybe big shout out to the universities. So have a look into it and give us some feedback. <laughs> I guess we reached the end of the talk time. There's so actually there's a one question. Last, one last question. Oh, it's, okay. oh. sorry? Yeah. There's a question from a virtual attendee. I'll read it out. Have you thought about the interactions of coding guidelines with respect to code coverage? If code coverage is present in the project, could coding guidelines be disregarded? In the end, the code is being checked for coverage. No. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> no. Okay. Maybe one last, one last question, question or? Yeah. Okay, just one last question. So um, I have a question on how do you recommend adding coding guidelines to an existing project, especially in a, quite an old existing project, because I've had developers complain about two things. One, it makes far too many changes. And secondly, it breaks Git blame. Yeah. So what, what we did in practice for some parts, because we were using pre-existing components, we said any new commit should comply to a coding guideline. This was one chance. We figured out that there are certain components which never get touched. For this part, we actually came up, but this was an agreement with the developers who said we would like to have a quality week. So we were not organized at sprints at all or anything, but we said here is a time of one week or two week, and we said let's go the other way around. When we often look at two critical parts and critical bugs, severe bugs, we said let's take two weeks just looking into minor, trivial, code quality things to just improve the overall quality. And this was well received, and we couldn't make it for all the developers because there are sometimes all these still firefighting guys in there. But by this, we got quite stable things also updated, reducing this. The worst thing which we wanted, we switched things on. Like I said this with a we warning all, we are all, uh, we are all. So this was something where we switched it on. We said, OK, this breaks everything. It will not give us a product for a time. But well, we made, set up a setup, test setup where just the divs were taken, and this helped a lot. So I would say take incremental approach, start with the diffs, see if it's not enough, see if you can get quality days or quality weeks, and then improve it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.